Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the museum. They said I only had four hours, so I gotta use that time <laughs> wisely. I've been pulled off a of stage before, and I've had people try to pull me off a of stage before, which is two different things. I'm gonna make one assumption, that is that people will be paying attention because you're teachers, and you hate it when students are not paying attention to you. So I'm assuming you're paying attention to me, okay? All right, uh, you see the disclaimer here? And those of you that know what I do know that some of these images are horrific, uh, but I didn't make the images. I didn't produce the images. The images that I produce as an artist are different from these. Uh, if you know H. Ross Perot, how many of you know H. Ross Perot? Good, that's, and more of you know H. Ross Perot <laughs> than have visited the Jim Crow Museum. That hurts me on the inside, okay. Anyway, if you know H. Ross Perot and you know American sociologists, then you know that we probably don't agree with a lot of the things that he says. But I think it's the law of probability. He talks a lot, I talk a lot, so we're bound to agree on something. This is the thing we do agree on. The activist is not the one who says the river is dirty. Anybody can jump on an airplane, fly into a community and tell people what's wrong. Hell, the people knew what was wrong before you came in there, before you got your big check, before you then went got back on the airplane, they knew the river was dirty. The real activist is the one who does what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Now don't make me do what she had to do, which is repeat something. The activist is the one that cleans the river. Not everybody likes the way we clean the river at the Jim Crow Museum, but a lot of the people that don't like it, their pant legs are dry, okay? We started out as in a very small room. Indeed, we were actually best described as visual storage, we 500 square feet. You gotta understand, the first time I went in the, came in the Wright Museum and saw this magnificent facility, I was both proud and what? Jealous. Because we, I only had 500 square feet, and yet, with only 500 square feet, we did good work. We had people doing the things that Americans claim they don't want to do, and that's talk about race. You know, sometimes I travel and people say, you know, if you would just stop talking about race, racism would go away. That doesn't even make stupid sense. <laughs> the reality is we talk about race all the time. We talk about it in corridors, at our offices, in restrooms, but we don't talk about it in places where our ideas are challenged. And that's what that little room did. A little room where we talked, we held objects and asked the question, when you see this, what is it you see? What makes you say that? Again, what is it you see? After many years of fundraising, 15 years, 15 years of big barring stilling, not enough stilling. I got a great stilling story, but they don't give me enough time. I'll tell you anyway. I used to tell the old president of Fair State University that if you could name an object, someone made a racist version of that object. And he said, no, 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 no. I said, no, 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 ashtrays, postcards, sheet music, toys, games, forks, doesn't matter. If it's a material object, if it's a three or two dimensional object, someone made a racist version. No, he said, and then one day he came to me so excited. He says, you know what I saw today? I saw a racist scarecrow. And I, I got excited because I thought he had gotten it. So I said to him, where is it? He says, well, it's still in the cornfield. I says, what are you talking about? Why didn't you go and get it? He says, well, the guy wasn't home. <laughs> I said on the TV show today that if you steal racist objects to donate to the Jim Crow Museum, it is not a sin. <laughs> so thanks to DTE for giving us that. That gave us a kind of validation. Does that make sense? It's a shame that it took that, but it did. It gave us external, outside validation 
And it also put pressure on the university to match it. And they not only matched it, but they exceeded it. And we got built. And so today, now instead of being crowded into one little room, we're crowded into seven or eight sections and having great discussions. What you see right there is what most people associate with Jim Crow. Now you're teachers, and I don't want to insult anyone because you will know a lot of what I'm saying, but I'll say this part. Many people think of Jim Crow as a synonym for those signs. But Jim Crow was not those signs. Jim Crow was a way of life. It was everything. You know, I'm a PhD, but I, I, I hate certain words. And I'll give you one of the words I hate, hegemony. Because I think every time someone uses the word hegemony, they're just showing off. <laughs> and yet, that's what white supremacy under Jim Crow was. It was hegemonic. You know what I mean by that? It was everything. Every way of acting, thinking, feeling, and behaving in the system. It was everything. Some mundane things like, could I light a woman's cigarette? No, if she was white. Could I play checkers together? Not if I was in Birmingham, Alabama. Could I show pity? No, because that implied superiority. So many rules and regulations that described and proscribed every interaction between blacks and whites. That's what hegemony, it's everything. It's not just a sign that says you can't come in here. I put this one up here. This is, um, um, what do you call it? A little booklet that went with a minstrel show. Why do you think I put this up here? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Not just, yeah, Michigan. We're, we're in Michigan. Are you guys familiar? I, don't you think they meant Birmingham, Alabama? Come on. No, they meant Birmingham, Michigan, because that's where it was being held. Why do I put that up there? Because those attitudes and tastes and values associated with Jim Crow were not just dominant in Birmingham, Alabama, Biloxi, Mississippi. Up south means two things. Did you get that one? Thomas Rice is given credit for founding the word or coining the term Jim Crow, and I really don't think he deserves it, but you know, so much of history is, is almost, un, you, you almost can't get to the real anymore. And you, what you end up with are people making cases for one thing or the other. This is my view, that Jim Crow was actually a slur. And I apologize for using that term. It was more along the line of darky. In other words, a slur, a demeaning slur. And Thomas Rice made the slur famous when he stood on stages, blackened his face, and acted as a buffoon. And he became famous in the United States and in Europe. Now, he obviously was not the first person to blacken his face. People have been doing that for centuries. And he wasn't the first person to get on a stage and act like a buffoon. But it was the perfect mixture and the perfect time. And here's one of the really interesting things. His imitators, and he had many, were often Irish are Jews, and they themselves had not been considered white. And in a kind of weird, perverted way, they became white by blackening their faces, mocking black people. Don't you think that's kind of deep? But this is deeper than that. Not shortly after the 1830s, black people blackened their already blackened faces, pretended to be whites, pretending to be blacks. Now that's America. Okay? <laughs> And then, and no one is sure exactly when, Jim Crow, first a slur, then a staged character's name, and eventually a prototype for a character, became a synonym for seg segregation and beyond. So that when W.B. Du Bois, one of my heroes, says that he doesn't want to go back down south because he doesn't want to be what? Jim Crowed. It had become a synonym. 
violence. You see that game right there? What that is, and I tried to recreate this, there was a time in America where blacks would stick their heads through cutout holes in banners and whites would throw rocks at them at carnivals. And if you go to our website, uh, Franklin Hughes, one of the people that works in my office, did an article about this and talks about the sort of evolution of that from rocks to softballs, which actually weren't soft, you know, they're, they're hard, to baseballs, and then eventually to being what we now would refer to as um, dunk tanks, where you hit the thing and the person falls down into the water. So I wanted to recreate in the museum, in this section of violence, this, this sort of brutal history. Why? Why even have a section on violence? Well, here's the answer. Jim Crow could not have worked in the United States without violence, without real violence and the everyday threat of violence. You understand what I mean? It couldn't work. There's no way it could work. You can't treat people like that without the threat of violence. And you can't just have the threat of violence. Every now and again, you have to have what? Real violence. So we recreated that room. And I don't know if you can see right behind that, that's a blown up postcard. Everyday object is a postcard. And on that postcard, there is a black man being beaten. Now, some of you are historians and you know that corporal punishment was legal in the U.S. at some point, right? And that you had states like Delaware, famous or infamous for Red Hannah. Why do you think it was called Red Hannah? The blood. And you don't have to be a social scientist or a sociologist to recognize that those people who hugged that, that pole and had their backs beaten were disproportionately peoples of color and poor whites. Would that surprise anybody? But what might surprise you is that the image was captured on postcards and prints and sold as everyday objects. How many of you have heard of Coon Chicken Inn? Three of you. I'm just going to need the three of you to sit together <laughs> so that I can. Uh, Coon Chicken Inn. Again, this is not from Mobile, Alabama. This is not from Biloxi, Mississippi. This is not from Pensacola, Florida, or Jackson, Mississippi. Spokane, Washington is where. Seattle, Portland. Coon Chicken Inn was like a horror show. It was a restaurant, but inside the restaurant was they put on blackface performances. I couldn't work in it. My skin's too light. You had to be jet black. They served fried chicken. There's nothing wrong with fried chicken. Even vegetarians like fried chicken, so there's nothing, <laughs> nothing wrong with fried chicken. Watermelon. I mean, just every caricature you could think of. Now, that's disturbing in and of itself, but for me, the way my mind works, this is what I'm thinking. A person is driving down the street, and this is what they see. The mouth of the Coon Chicken Inn Porter is so large that that's the door. You don't think of a restaurant as propaganda, do you? Right? I mean, propaganda, creating, dissem creating and disseminating information for the express purpose of shaping an opinion, that does that, doesn't it? But it's a restaurant. The, um, I have to watch what I'm saying, too, because you guys are videotaping this. <laughs> I love everybody, and the world is good. So we'll just st <laughs> stop with that. Um, the grandson of the owner of this place tried to sell me all their memorabilia. He, he wanted too much. Um, but I had a chance to see sort of the, the different incarnations of Coon Chicken Inn in those three cities and to see the things that went inside them. So what we did in the museum was we recreated the face because the other pillar of Jim Crow, violence, and the other are everyday objects. I don't know why people don't make that connection. But you can't see millions and millions and millions of objects that portray black people as inferiors and not recognize that those objects are both reflecting, but also doing what? Shaping attitudes toward. If all I knew about African Americans 
were the material objects that I saw in the 1930s and 1940s, I wouldn't want one for president either. And if I accepted that they still are like that, I wouldn't want one for president now. So we walked through there, and uh, I had fun with the, you know, the, the museum was in my head. If you go to most museums, and I say this advisedly uh, because I'm in a museum now, so I'm not referencing the right museum. I don't know if this is the case. But most museums I've been in in my life, and I've been in dozens, there's a wall that big, and there's one actual artifact up there. There might be some didactic panels, but there's one artifact. One. And I'm thinking, A, we don't have enough space for that luxury, and B, if we do that, we're not telling the real story we want to tell. Because the story we want to tell is that these objects were so pervasive in our culture that the only word that I can come up with to describe them is a word that's usually associated in theology, and that word is they were omnipresent everywhere. They were so present, you didn't see them when you saw them. But when you put them all in one room, then you realize what's been seeping in people's brains all these years. And so people stand there and they think, oh my goodness. And we've put now, we're, we're over 10,000, nearing 11,000 pieces. And when you have an object, that's an everyday object. You get what I mean? It's an, a bank. It's a children's bank. And that's in someone's home. And, and I'll give you this right here. This is the real significance of using everyday objects to promote racial propaganda. Those objects have a function. Follow me. That bank functions as a bank. A racist ashtray functions as an ashtray. You get where I'm going? A racist postcard functions as a postcard. So people use the objects. And they use it without consciously sometimes thinking of what it is. Like when I purchase racist games, I'll have students play the racist games. It's amazing how many white American students started speaking in Ebonics when they play the game. But what's also amazing and significant is while they're playing the game, after a certain amount of time, they just start trying to win the game. See, you get where I'm going with this? The function of it normalizes it, makes it OK. I mean, if you've seen lawn jockeys, everybody. If, you've, if you haven't seen a lawn jockey, you're just not looking. And if you come to the museum, you'll see we have a whole section. We have a garden of lawn jockeys, and we tell the history of lawn And there's a story out that's not true that people talk about, but that's OK. The purpose of the museum is to get people dialoguing about what is true. You'll notice also in this particular picture, there's a Michigan State lawn jockey. Do you see that? I would give $1 million for a University of Michigan lawn jockey. If you don't know history, it's like walking in traffic. Here's an example. You remember Florence Griffith Journal and Jackie Journal Kersey? Remember them? When they were really popular, I think it was Cosmo magazine. Someone check that. For the tape, check it. I'm saying I think it was them. I'm almost positive it was them. Someone wrote an article about Jackie Journal Kersey, is that right, and, and Florence Griffith Journal. And they refer to them in the article as the gold dust twins. OK? They didn't know. Someone had just heard a phrase. If you don't know history, it's like walking in traffic. Okay. I thought I'd put that postcard up here. Every group that has existed in the United States has been caricatured, every group. Okay, so you can talk about the Native Americans and caricatured as brutes and savages and poor whites, you know, as either the Waltons or the people from the movie Deliverance. 
Japanese Americans during World War II, every group has been caricatured. But no group has been caricatured as much, as often, and in, in as many ways as African Americans. And one of those caricatures is the caricature of the Sambo, the lazy and dumb, childlike figure. Many of the caricatures of African Americans began doing slavery and have morphed into the present. Okay. I brought this one not necessarily to talk about caricatures, but again, because I wanted to show you, where was that mailed to? Schoolcraft. This is an important slide because we have a space in the museum that are just new objects. When people talk about Jim Crow, they want to disassociate themselves. See, and now, I, I have always thought this, that many Americans have a harder time with Jim Crow than they do with slavery. The slaves are all dead. But Jim Crow was a recent enough period that it begs some questions. And one of the questions it begs is, what about now? See? And that section of the museum is a design to address a question that I've gotten from people, which is, why do we keep talking about this? All the pieces in that section of the museum, and you're only getting a bit of that right there, all the pieces are pieces produced in the last five years. And uh, now, don't get it twisted. America is more democratic and more egalitarian than it has been at any time in its history. We have made tremendous progress, yet the struggle continues. When you have a t-shirt that says, any white guy in 2012, that's a Jim Crow era thinking morphed into the present. All the old images have been reproduced on new things like soap and clocks and mouse pads, but new caricatures have emerged. So when you see images like this, as soon as something comes out, I get a phone call that says, does the Jim Crow Museum have this? And I'll tell you a secret. One of the mistakes I made, and I made many in this journey because I never started out, I didn't start out thinking to build a museum. I just started out thinking I had to collect this stuff for some reason to use to teach people. The mistake I made was naming this the Jim Crow Museum. It made sense at the time because it was a nice umbrella term that subsumed most of my collection. But it gave people and still sometimes gives people the opinion that I'm only dealing with things from what? The past. This is something my friend Khalid El-Hakim, one of my old students, taught me. He created the Black History 101 Museum. I'm very proud of him. I'm proud of all my students. Well, that's a lie. <laughs> you, <laughs> that's not a lie you can say to teachers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's, that's just a stupid lie to say. You know, it's just something you say. I take that back. I'm proud of a lot of my students. And I'm especially proud of him because he created a traveling museum. But he also challenged me when I would come in class every day 20 years ago. I had, Dreadlocks in those days. Went, you know, took the fro, went, locked up my hair. Look at this punishment. <laughs> it's punishment for a life poorly lived. You know, and I got to wear a nice hat for people to tell me I look good, you know. <laughs> but he challenged me in class because I'd bring in a piece, you know, and, I, and I'd show him the piece, and he said, well, why don't you have anything positive? And I was like, it's not that kind of museum. But what he was really trying to say to me was this that if you're gonna have a museum that focuses on racism, there ought to be stories about people's resistance. And so I started collecting objects on African-American achievement and the civil rights movement. So it is easier to reach into my back pocket to pull out money to buy something about George Washington Carver or Booker T. Washington or some African-American who's not in the February group than it was to purchase those racist things. And I don't know if you can see right here, right up to the top, there's a black woman who was uh, in World War II, and that's, that's her hat right underneath her. What a powerful piece. It wasn't, I mean, 
it's even more powerful because when you think of the thousands of African Americans who were killed, and the ones who were killed a little bit every day, when you think of Goodman, Cheney, and Swerner, and remember in Eyes on the Prize, how they talked about while they were digging for them and dr dragging rivers for them, they found, the quote they used I would never use, but the quote they used was, we found many unnamed bodies. Well, the reason I wouldn't use it is because, and this, now I'm speaking not like a sociologist, but, but a southerner, because God gave everybody a name. We got names. The mural in our museum of blacks and whites who died during the Civil Rights Movement, they have names on them because 50 years from now, nobody would know who they were. And they have names. My favorite piece in the museum, if there's such a thing, I have one of the ink pens that President Lyndon Baines Johnson used to sign the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the most comprehensive civil rights act in this country's history. I have one of the ink pens that, you know how they write like two letters and then they, I have one of them, paid $20 for it. Someone who appropriated it <laughs> to do God's work. And I didn't want to, I'm, I'm gonna give, give me 10 minutes, I'm gonna get done. We, we, I, I struggle with whether or not to have a section on music and, and athletics because stereotypes are associated there. But then I thought, Jackie Robinson did as much to stop Jim Crow as Martin Luther King did. And not only that, you could make the argument, so did Mahalia Jackson and some of them. They fought Jim Crow in their own way. You know who that is? $200,000, anyone who could, gone, too late. That is, <laughs> when Minister Malcolm was killed, his wife was pregnant. Betty Shabazz, Ms. Shabazz was pregnant with twins, right? That's one of those twins. Man, you gotta know that made my heart feel good. When she came to the Jim Crow Museum, sat underneath the mural of her father, the mural which includes also a depiction of her father, and by the way, does the thing with her hand that her father, Minister Malcolm, did. And I said to her, what do you think your mother would think with the depiction of your father? And she said she would have cried. So I thought, now it's a good time for me to cry. Is this the way you teach? So anyway, we got a phone call from um, Professor Gates saying that uh, they wanted to come to the museum because in the episode that dealt with Jim Crow, they were gonna talk about racist imagery. I was like, well, we have some of those. <laughs> so he came, and at like 7.30 in the morning, we were filming. And I wanna show you real quickly some of the images that they use. And he said very complimentary thing. I'm not saying it just because it's us, but he was very generous, said that we were one of the most significant historical facilities in America. And I thought, dude, stop it. No, what I mean is, say that more. <laughs> say that louder. Say that to these big companies that I begged to build us, but were afraid to be the lead gift because they were afraid they would end up being the only giver. And afraid that people wouldn't understand because of the name. They would think we were a shrine. Even though I was saying, we are a shrine to racism the same way a hospital is a shrine to disease. So he came. I'm the one on this side. Over here. <laughs> and some of these images, I have no idea why they selected the ones they wanted. These are mostly postcards. They wanted flat images, and that makes sense. I mean, I get that. They only selected one three-dimensional image. And I gave them what I thought they should use, the association of African Americans with animals. The idea being, we're not at the top of the food chain. We're less, less human. See, I see people all the time when they refer to President Obama as a monkey, or directly or indirectly talk about how he's, it's time for him to stop monkeying around, that kind of stuff. And then someone would say, yeah, but they did that with President Bush. Yeah, but it was different. In President Bush, they were saying he was as dumb as a monkey. With President Obama, they're saying he's not human. That's not the same insult. Neither one of them are good. And 
why is it not okay to just say I disagree with your policies? As I said before, our goal is to get people to talk openly and honestly. I will tell you this, I think young children from the day they're born should be, that we should start the process of talking about race, but I don't think they should come to the Jim Crow Museum. They certainly should not come unaccompanied. Okay? Now that sounds incongruent, but it's not. We should not avoid conversations, but those conversations should be age appropriate. The museum is not yet age appropriate for very young people. I've had an argument with people for that for years. We try to get people to watch the videos before they come, including one of ours. All our stuff is free and open to the public. This is the basis of, for us. We believe if you show us any material object, we can tell you something about the culture. As I said before, all the objects and imagery is still being made. Folks say to me, what's the most common reaction you get? Is it anger? Is it embarrassment? Is it guilt? No. It's reflective sadness. But we don't stop there. We use it as to keep talking. What we do is we do exercises. We, Khalid and I, the other day, we took a gollywog doll at Western Michigan University and passed around a class of 12 people and just asked them, tell me what you see when you see this. There are no right or wrong answers. What is it you see? And we had 12 people go around, and it was the deepest conversation about race I've been in in 10 years. You can teach with objects. And this is just a personal part of my credo, or part of my personal credo. When I was at Ohio State, they used to tell me, you're not a social worker. It's not your job to fix the culture. Your job is to do scientifically, empirically sound, thorough, objective research. And I warred with that the whole time I was there. Because I believed then, although I didn't articulate it this way, that knowledge for the sake of knowledge is a waste of knowledge. If it's not improving this world, you just wasted your time and you satisfied some idle curiosity. Those are some of our resources. I'll leave the material with you in case people want to see it. And then I always want to end on a picture that shows something redemptive. And that's one of the things I've learned to do. When I get done doing my work on a computer, I then type in this racial reconciliation. And I go to the many sites that show people working together and working well together. Thank you so much for having me here.